One of America's preeminent streamliners is Burt Rattan. In stark contrast to the pyramid he lives in, he conjures up planes with curved, flowing lines. When I'm designing a wing, I think first about what I want to do with the air. Uh, if I want an airplane to be very efficient, I take a lot of air and move it just a little bit down. And you do that with a long wing airplane. A short wing airplane, like a fighter that, that has real short wings, it has to take less air and move it more energetically down. And in doing so, it, it's, it's not as efficient. It causes more drag. And walked out of the jungle. Rattan designed these planes so that you could build one in your garage. A cross between a wasp and a Star Wars fighter. Rattan named this horizontally challenged plane the Long Easy. Pilots called it a clean ship because it's streamlined. And it doesn't have lots of struts and wires sticking out to cause drag. Another one of Rattan's attempts at turning the world of aviation upside down. Some people actually enjoy this kind of thing. I like to take off, roll inverted, and fly out to my practice area. It gives me a much better view of everything anyway. So, And I like to be upside down. It, it stretches my back out and feels good. As long as the angle of attack is right, it doesn't matter which surface of the wing is facing up. But aerobatic planes are designed to fly upside down. The shape of the wing is very specific to an aerobatic airplane in that it's considered symmetrical, so that the airflow is the same whether you're upright or inverted. So you can fly the plane inverted almost in the same attitude with the same nose position as you can when you're upright. So we've learned how to fly inverted, fly faster, and fly higher, surpassing the birds in the sky. But some still look to nature's flying creatures for inspiration. I think all pilots are inspired by nature and inspired by birds. And a lot of times when I'm up flying, I'll see a bird sort of circling around a hawk, maybe watching me, or, or an eagle sometimes. And, and um, yeah, and we're all kind of jealous of them too, because they do it so effortlessly. If you had a cloud's eye view, this is what you would see birds capable of reaching speeds over 100 miles an hour. Others navigating halfway around the globe. Soaring effortlessly on the wind for hours. And performing aerobatic maneuvers that would make a fighter pilot's head spin. They, they have enormous flexibility. They can put their wings forward or aft or up or down or change. In fact, every feather on a bird a bird may have 10,000 feathers, and every feather is a control surface. Every feather, he can feel the local air on whether it's smooth or turbulent, whether he can lift more there or less, and he can change his shape uh, instantaneously, enormously, in terms of changing the direction of flight. They're much more maneuverable than the best fighter. So a bird, really, in every way, Oh my gosh, look at these wings. In every way is a lot more interesting than a little old fixed wing airplane, isn't he? Oh boy. Birds serve as living blueprints of the theory of flight. But it wasn't always that way. Nature has taken millions of years to turn them into the flying machines they are today. The architecture of a bird is what makes it such an efficient flyer. Their hollow, buoyant bones combine lightness and strength. Powerful breast muscles drive the stroke of the wing, and these wings do it all, thrusting them forward and creating lift. Thrust comes from the primary feathers at the wing tips, which act almost like propellers the tips twist up at an angle to the rest of the wing. They bite into the air like the blades of a propeller, pulling the bird forward. At the same time, the rest of the wing provides the lifting surface to stay aloft. 
But the pioneers of flight were victims of a common misconception, that birds swim across the sky propelled by a backward and downward wing stroke. We attempted this flapping winged flight, but our wing envy resulted in broken bones and bruised egos. The human body is not designed to fly, but if we were to go back to the drawing board and make some changes, it would take more than just a set of wings. Muscle-powered flight would require big shoulders, really big shoulders, to anchor the muscles necessary to thrust us forward and up. And underneath those muscles, hollowed bones for lightness and a more streamlined shape. It might not be pretty, but it would get us airborne like the birds. Birds were the motivation for humans flying. They were the symbols, the thing you saw, and certainly have given humans a great craving for flight. The secrets of lift and drag are older than the first bird. The laws of nature and properties of our atmosphere are the same for a falcon as they are for an F-14. But the lift and thrust combined in nature's design had to be separated in order for humans to fly. The closest we could come to bird flight is soaring, using fixed wings for lift and the Earth's downward pull for thrust. Without gravity, you couldn't fly. Because that's what's pulling you down, that pulls you far, and then you hopefully you catch air, which is being moved up and down by the varying densities and being acted on by gravity, and that's what pushes you back up again. Gravity is a thrust. Unpowered flight means learning how to use the movement of air. It's ripples, currents, and rising columns. You watch birds in flight uh, that if they're spiraling up, there's a thermal air, you go over and join the bird. Sometimes the bird will see you spiraling up and it'll come and join you. You literally feel like you are floating looking down at the earth. You have a full hemisphere of vision below you. And uh, it's very quiet. There's also just that magic moment when you fling yourself off a cliff and don't die. It's sort of like death and resurrection. And then you land after a flight and you're, you're still alive. It's, it's quite a feeling, it really is. <laughs>